Hello, it's Simon again, and welcome to Rails to Nowhere, and welcome back to the second part of my chat with Emily and Paul from Round and Round We Go on the branding and design of London transport in the 1920s and 30s. In this episode, we're focusing primarily on the corporate design of London Transport, so the Roundel, the Johnston typeface, all these good things. And we're going to jump straight in with discussions on typefaces. So now we move a little bit more into graphic design and away from architecture. So we talked earlier about all the advertisements that existed on railway stations at the time and these didn't just exist outside they existed on the platforms they exist everywhere and this causes a little bit of a problem it causes a little bit of a problem if you're a rural station with 20 passengers getting off each train because it makes it sometimes a little harder to work out where the booking office is but if you're running a metro system where you're wanting to shift hundreds thousands of people um, in and out of your space having all of your station covered in lots of posters and then having an inconsistent sty- signage style it becomes really hard to actually move people through the station reliably this is still something that TFL and metro systems around the world think about all the time is how do we make our signage clear and easy to read so that people see it and move off as one of the big things whenever a metro system is built or rebuilt or redesigned and one of the big things with the elizabeth why are the elizabeth line stations so big it's because how do we move people off of platforms nice and quickly you want to make that happen and very early on it is clear that the deep level lines especially are identifying problems with people not being able to find their way around the station not being able to navigate very easily and they begin to think about how we're going to solve this and again we come back to our friend Leslie Green because he's one of the first people to sort of consistently try and address this a standard thing I think at the time because you see it on CSLR stations and um, CLR stations you see signage fired into the tiles but Leslie Green is the first to sort of think well what if we had a consistent design of sign with as consistent a font as I can make the different tiling companies um, produce. And you get those sort of to the trains and way out um, signs from the Leslie Green stations as with the sort of cartouches around them. Looking at you both sort of staring at me intently. <laughs> yep, no, that was that was a good summary of it, yep. <laughs> no, I, I, I often think, and I don't know because I should look into this more, Paul, you might know more, Was that just a cost saving measure that happened to work out really well for for signage and or was it because consistency saves money? But how intentional was that and how much was that about economics? Do you know? It's I think there is sadly so little detail of what went on with Leslie Green in that we've got some records of him being commissioned to design the station surface buildings. We've got some more records of him being paid for later on his work on the tiling but that almost seems to be retrospective and the agreements that he would actually do the tiling and what level of detail he designed them to and to what extent he was coming up with basic patterns which were then put into action more independently by the tiling contractors all that sort of thing all the thinking behind those cartouches is really quite lost to history at this point and the cartouches aren't that consistent there's a lot of stations Mm. the first few stations to be built i think especially on the bakerloo didn't have them and then they came along later when they were doing the pick and the Hampstead, and they only lasted a couple of years as well because really quickly by 1908 they were covering them up with Mm. more conventional enamel siling signage and this is this is the real shame with all of it because there's So much written about the surface buildings, there's so much written about the architecture, there's so much written about the logo and Johnston typeface and all of these things, but there's actually very little written about signage generally, never mind the specific signage put up in the early 1908 stations of the, um, or sorry, before 1908 stations of the underground group, which is, as you say, is a real shame because there is a lot of sort of history disappeared. 
what I find quite interesting and strange about Leslie Green stations is they aren't all the same. Mm. And the, like as Paul's pointing out, you know, when you start digging into them. So, for example, you know, we do we'll, if we're doing an episode about a Leslie Green station, we look it up in all the Leslie Green books and they're like, this one has a slight divot in it or this one sticks out a little bit here or it has this different yes. arcade thing. And it's just quite, quite strange that there is that level of consistency. The only thing I can p- compare it to is like early 2000s bands where like Destiny's Child where everyone wears the same fabric but it's in a different cut it's like you've got that level of of consistency that's so close but there are those individual flourishes and that's what's interesting to me and yeah. that's what is you know Paul's saying is lost to time where those flourishes came from why yeah. was it just the tiling companies was it Leslie Green having this level of control and it's so it's so frustrating because you're like why why did Knightsbridge have this little divot that the other ones didn't have yeah and was and there this... logic behind I mean I think this is the next topic isn't it is the colors used on the stations what was the logic behind which which colours at which stations, and nobody yeah. has any idea. Um, on Yeah, and on the note of consistency between the stations, um, doing the research for this, I was reading a write-up of a talk, I want to say, that Doug Rose, who wrote Tiles of the Unexpected, did for the Underground, the London yeah. Underground Rail Society, where he was talking about um, I, uh, doing the research for Tiles of the Unexpected and going to the stations and surveying the stations, and initially being like, oh yeah, we can work out the patterns and all of that by just counting how many tiles across there are between the passages and things, and then realising that actually there's all sorts of rows of tiles that are half tiles and quarter tiles and third tiles because of the way the passages, because the passages are determined by where the tunnel rings are and the engineers just put those in, and then they've had to cut it up and actually realising that actually there's a huge amount of variety in what looks to be a fairly standard because whenever you sort of talk to the transport museum or anyone like that, they'll be like, oh, yeah, it's just a cut and paste set of parts that are just sort of put together. And actually, the moment you start digging into any sort of detail, you realise that actually that is true. But to steal a phrase from um, an early 2000s film, it's layers and layers and layers of detail as you go in. And to add to those layers, this is the thing I keep banging on about, is although... We use a shorthand calling them Leslie Green stations. He was very much responsible for a fairly limited element of those stations, yes. like the appearance of the surface level buildings and to some extent the tiling pattern, although how much of that was interpretation by the contractors, yeah. we don't really know exactly. Well, like He did not design the layouts. He did not have anything to do no. with the tunnel rings and the passageway set outs and all that kind of thing. And, and it's that sort of singular genius element that is such a popular kind mm. of narrative, particularly when you think of things like modernism. But there would be a whole team of people making decisions Absolutely. around that. It's not just one man's planning yeah. 45-ish stations, depending on how you count them, and being like, yes, you do this. There's there's obviously, even if project management didn't exist in the form it does today, there's going to be a lot of people involved in managing that. Yeah, and we, and we know this is the case because while we, again, we think of Holden stations and we talk about Holden stations, but like, like Leslie Green, he's the consultant architect. Yes, he's the lead architect. And again, like Leslie Green, we don't necessarily know exactly how involved he is or isn't in various aspects. But we know very early on that some of his early stations, Frank Pick writes to him and says, stop getting the contractor to do these bits and pieces because they're doing a suboptimal job and makes Holden become more involved in bits of the work. And then we know that later on into the 30s and 40s, when Holden becomes a much busier architect again, that he again starts stepping back from the design of the stations. And again, occasionally there are complaints from the underground group that the quality of the design isn't quite what they would have expected. So we know we know that the architects are delegating at various points. But as we say, as you say, there's just so little written really on Leslie Green. It's so this is the thing for someone who's so prominent in London underground history, it's hard to research anything about him and what he was doing. I think, you know, the underground group in that period, I would say, is very closely comparable with a modern move fast and break things startup company. They yes. were in the space of seven years going from zero to hundreds of stations, huge network, dozens of station buildings being designed. 
massive change in how London's transport network was organised and run, led by an eccentric, domineering American tycoon. Um, lots of, you know, semi-criminal financial behaviour yeah. going on. It was not an organisation, I think, at that stage, which was keeping meticulous records of how no. they were doing things. It was an re- organisation that was going with some mustachioed tyrant at the top waving his stick about and saying do this do this do this get it done fast as possible got to get these railways open before we go bust yeah and that's the thing if we like we talk about um not pick um jerky's more in our in in a bonus episode on him but if there's there's anything we know about him it is that he's in stuff mainly for a quick buck he wants to make a return on his investment reasonably quickly like so yeah you're right it's very much that sort of early startup and Sadly, for those of us doing our history, that means we don't have the records. It's the same. So if we come back to, kind of back to where we started off with, with the chaos of signage. Um, so we've sort of got an attempt at some consistency with the Leslie Green stations. Again, as we say, hard to identify whether that's Leslie Green or the engineers or who that is that's bringing any level of consistency to that. But once Frank Pick begins to become involved as publicity officer for the underground group, he is very keen on the idea that there should be a level of consistency in what the organisation is doing with its signage and its writing. And an early example of this, we mentioned it earlier, is, um, or an early inspiration of this for him, is what WH Smith are doing on the stations with their booths. So WH Smith, um, from the reading I've done, um, is apparently the originator of a company um, typeface as a concept. In about 1903, 1904, um, Eric Gill... Eric Gill? Is that the right name? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. The pedophile um, one? Yes. Is he the pedophile one? Yeah, he's the, he's the horrendous yeah. everything file, um, file he's man. He's commissioned to do a couple of um, signs for WH Smith, and he creates a serif font for them... And then they say, actually, yes, let's adopt this. We want to adopt this for all of our signs and we want to have this as our corporate font. And you will still know that font because it is the font that still says WH Smith on the front of WH Smith shops. So if you've seen one of those, you've seen this font. And so the combination of the same colour on the background of the sign and the same font on the sign creates this sort of clear identity for the booths and Frank Pick apparently looks at those and goes that is a good idea and he pinches it and through contacts he is set up with meetings with Gill and Gill's um, former teacher um, Johnston who then they have various conversations and they discuss various things And I know Emily's got a quote on on this somewhere. Um, I know he tried to do it himself first. He had a go at designing a font and decided it was too hard. It was was one of those things that looks easy. And then he was like, oh, no, this isn't easy, really, is it? I shall find someone else who can do this properly. And so, yes, so Pick initially tries to design some fonts himself and and ends up in conversation with both Gil and Johnston about the creation of uh, a font for the underground group. And as a result, be very me? picky and say it was a typeface. Sorry, yes. I do you know what? I was really careful when writing this script to make sure I used the word typeface. Um, I'm sure the word font has snuck its way in somewhere. Mm. Um, but I've <laughs> been trying. I was trying to be careful to use the word typeface, and now when we're recording, I keep forgetting. <laughs> what What is the difference between a font and a typeface? Just to so a typeface it. is the generic design for the letters. A font is specifically a use of the typeface in a particular point size and a particular weight. So like Johnston uh, is a typeface. Johnston 10-point bold is a font. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Would you like me to read the quote Yeah. What, what Frank Pick wanted in a font? This is coming from uh, an alphabet for London, but it is a quote from Frank Pick. He made it clear, though, that the typeface must be a strong and unmistakable symbol with a high degree of individuality, clear and open and suited to be highly visible on perhaps poorly lit platforms, 
straightforward and manly with a character of an official railway sign not to be mistaken by people in a hurry for a traitor's advertisement as he would say it and all of that i think is fairly reasonable except for the manly bit which we were talking about earlier and yeah i'm, I'm curious what the definition of a manly font was at the time because i think i guess i think today a manly font font would if you want to go with gender stereotypes would be something without sort of like flourishes and curls mm. and things paul and i were joking the original version of johnson had hearts on the eyes but he said no that's not manly enough and turned them into <laughs> diamonds but um yeah that i that would be how i would picture it if we went with sort of ger- gender gender stereotypes of i'm sorry paul tight faces um but i think actually i don't know if that's what that meant i don't know yeah. what would be considered a manly or non-manly font. what was a feminine then. type yeah. face like I think we need to dig more into the history of typefaces and gender yeah. stereotypes and see some examples. Yeah, because... There's a whole podcast episode on that, yeah. Not this podcast, but a different podcast, yeah. We'll do that after we make the COD Past podcast. Anyway, um, but yeah, because penmanship was such a thing that actually I feel as yeah. if having a nice cursive handwriting might have been considered manly. I don't know. I don't know what fonts are manly. I'm not sure. I'm Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but what Johnston designs is what's called a sans serif typeface. So for those who don't know their typefaces, the serif typeface is one with little bits uh, at the ends of the letters. Um, so uh, if you open up Microsoft Word and look for something like Times New Roman, which for a very long time was the default font and isn't anymore, that's a serif font. And then a sans serif font is without the those are called serifs and it's without those bits it's something like johnston that we see on the underground that just has the 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 clear lines and apparently he he specifically requested sans serif because wh smith was serif so wanted the opposite of that for sticking out on the platforms which would have had wh smith stands on them which makes sense um i think also a sans serif font kind of fits better with the modernist aesthetic that they're looking for whether that's actually something that was factoring into his decision i don't know intriguingly the city in south london used a really quite elegant sans serif i'm not sure even a typeface really because it was just on the tiling and some of Mm. their technical drawings but if you look at the early photos of uh euston city in south london they've got a really kind of clear sans serif which is very different from the leslie green style decorative art nouveau text that he used on his stations in places or the rather less elegant sans serif used on other leslie green areas yeah um and I, i can't help but wonder if if pick had seen some of that city in south london design of lettering and thought oh that's really nice as well yeah and and certainly johnston is a much lighter typeface um, or when it's rendered it's usually rendered as a much lighter or in fact it just is even in bold it's quite a light typeface as opposed to what um, an alphabet for london and a lot of other ter- books term the grotesque fonts used by a lot of the other railways which were just sort of almost a solid wall of ink with a couple of little bits cut out of them to make the shapes of the letters almost and it was felt that the lighter lighter typeface would be much easier to read and much clearer to see on a sign and also kind of gives you a white a nice white a nice amount of white around the letters as well which if you're putting it on an enamel sign or any other sort of sign it makes it uh make means you get a nice surround as well which is also important for readability yeah it's interesting i don't think anyone was thinking about visual accessibility in the way we do today for people who are visually impaired or for people who are dyslexic and those sorts of things but it very much is a readable font Mm. in the same way we look at readable fonts today for those reasons because sans serif fonts are more readable in that sense so it's an interesting that's a modern lens putting on it but so yeah so the underground group adopts johnston as its font and it combines that with signage designs creates it's new sort of steins and these again they start going into um the holden stations and holden's holden or holden's team whichever it is are working on various aspects of signage of the stations and they quickly begin adopting the johnston font the first proper rollout um of the font is in the 1920s with the edgeware extension because that's the first big expansion of the underground built following its adoption 
And then again in 1938, there's the Carr Edwards report, um, which is about signage and wayfinding and how it can be improved. And again, this is used as an ad- a point to adopt it more on signage. And it would also come to be combined with something which we've alluded to earlier, which is the roundel, which would develop over this period as well and was also designed by Johnston, um, at least in some degree. The roundel's a weird one. Nobody really knows exactly who exactly designs it, but Johnston definitely does some design work on it, uh, certainly the sort of final versions. So the UERL wants a logo very early on. Logo's not really a thing the railway companies necessarily are doing in the early 1900s. Again, we're uh, we're coming back to the fact that this is the period where corporate design is not really very strong. You've got crests, which is, I guess, the closest you get to a logo. So if you think about the Metropolitan Railway, it has a crest, um, which uh, was utilised on various bits of rolling stock. But there's no really sort of logo like we'd think of, because um, you'd sort of imagine a logo sort of a fairly simple sort of graphic Um, element and there's none of that sort of really in the Victorian era we're all very flourishy they do like their um, flourishes in the Victorian and Edwardian era and the UERL adopts what I would say is an early form of logo because it's certainly not a crest but it's rather chaotic Um, they ran a competition to design it didn't they which I love it was a competition in the the London Evening News of like somebody come up with a logo for us and Uh, what was the reference to it I was looking up it was um, yeah the the London Evening News announced that there was a £10 prize to any reader who can supply the London Electric Railway with a new logo and it was Mr WJ Pawsey employed in the show card department of Imperial Tobacco who was chosen from 4,000 entries by a representative of the underground group and the Evening News but it is busy (laughs) Yes. It is a very busy piece of graphic design. Um, for those who don't know it, it's... Um, I want to no, no, it's the LNER that's, the, that's called the Sunburst logo, but it's it's kind of... It's, it's a lot of trains coming out from a cityscape um, with underground electric railways or whatever written across the top, and <laughs> I haven't got a picture in front it's, of me. I'm trying to it's describe... Beautiful. It's beautiful as oh, design, it really is. but it's it's not a logo. No. It's, no. There's way too much going on there. You could print it on the front of a timetable, which they did a lot, but you yeah. couldn't print it on the side of a train or anything no. like that, effectively, or put it on the station the same way that we do with a roundel today. Yes. As we move into the 1900s, the companies that will come together to form the underground are really beginning to sort of move towards this idea that they want to be a little bit more branded, they want to have an identity, they want to um, create a sense of who they are. And I think it's fair to say that the first that really effectively and universally does this is the Metropolitan Railway, um, who at some point before the 1920s begin to at least occasionally refer to themselves as the Metro as well as the Met. And I um, i don't know about you, but I am still at a loss as to when exactly they begin doing this. I see various references to it as the Metro through the 1920s and 30s. Not consistently. It is tied in with Metroland, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think they started off referring to themselves in short as the Met, and then when Metroland came along around, what was that, sort of 1915, they then started yeah. referring to themselves as the Metro to keep that idea going. Yeah, and that's and that's really where I'm going with this, is that they, they, they begin Metroland, they begin a universal branding of both the place they serve as Metroland and the service that provided to it as the Metro, um, which you can see very um, effectively in the poster or one of the posters advertising the opening of the Stanmore extension, which talks about the Metro extension to Stanmore. Um, And I like that one a lot because it's got a big key on it, which gives us a really nice example of them talking about how they're unlocking the suburbs. Um, But I'll be talking a bit more about that with Ella in the next episode when we talk about advertising in more detail. And so, yes, so the Metropolitan Railway begins this sort of brand identity as the Met and the Metro, and that begins to be used throughout advertising and very clearly um, advertising who they are and giving them that identity. 
And at around the same time, we see the underground group beginning to emerge. I mean, for a start, the underground group begins to emerge as a thing, um, because that is founded in, oh, how have I managed to forget this? It's um, sort of 1901, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah, but that's what he buys the district, yeah. Yeah, it's, and then it's, it's a process of amalgamations as he takes over the rest of the two yeah. projects he sticks his fingers into. Um, yeah, because we see Yerkes arrive in 1901 and buy the district, and then, yeah, through there we, we get the amalgamation of the other routes, and that's as the underground group begins to form, and then the actually quite young underground group gets Frank Pick joining it in 1908... I should yes. know this. This year was the after last episode. Uh, year Ashfield. after Gibb. So yes, no, because he's before Ashfield, isn't he? He's 1907, I think, with Gibb. Yes. If I remember rightly. Yes. Yes. He he comes, yes, because he, he comes with Gibb because he is Gibb's assistant at the Northeastern and comes with Gibb to continue being his assistant at the new post. And Frank Pick, the reading I've done has not been particularly clear on exactly what he was up to, but he's up to something to do with advertising and um, corporate image in Gibbs' office, which makes sense. He's the assistant to the general manager, so he's presumably getting a lot of things coming across his desk and being asked to help with various things. And he impresses um, Gibb with that work, and he is promoted to work in or head up. Oh, God, how do I forget these things? Um it was Publicity Officer, I think, was yeah, his title, he is, wasn't it? he is Quite given the role of Publicity Officer. I think that's the first thing he does outside of Gibbs' office. And so we see the underground group begin moving towards wanting its own design. And I've just realised there's an entire segment of this script that I have completely forgotten about. <laughs> the bit on buses. Have you forgotten buses? <laughs> Don't upset Emily by forgetting buses. I actually hadn't got anything written in buses. I'm sorry. I, yes, I, uh, you have. You've got a whole I? bit about... Uh, I around the same time, the LGOC decides to adopt a symbol to easily identify vehicles oh, in yes. the crowded world of early London bus operations. There we go. But in fact, the the whole you, there's a, the buses are a really interesting early example of branding being developed because just at the time that they were converting from horse buses to motor buses which was an amazingly swift transition in the mm. first sort of decade of the 20th century one of the there was a new operator which came in from the start as a motor bus operator with somebody from i think thomas tilling who'd become mm. the manager of this new solely motor bus operation and he decided that rather than follow the old strategy of the prominent branding being the route that each individual vehicle was working on he they would have route numbers that could be displayed yeah. to show where you were going and use a brand name for the whole fleet which was vanguard above oh, rather than just using that. your long company name and that was the first one to have a bold fleet name and then all the other bus companies started having to pick up a bold fleet name and that's where you got general in massive letters on the london yes. general omnibus group and you got things like express and tilling and so on all put on these big bold fleet names and then used much smaller route numbers or descriptions of the route rather than that being the prominent branding yes yes i'd forgotten about that when scripting out this script which is interesting because it's something that actually bus companies could still learn from today in lots of places outside london it's a it's yeah. a lesson that manchester has just really at least put back into place with their yeah. new b network thing it's one of those things that is extremely frustrating to anyone who's in a rural area or a smaller city, just the sort of chaotic different bus branding. Yeah. And then following on from all of this, in 1907, we get the branding of the Underground emerge out of the Conference of London Underground Railways, um, which is formed in 1907, comprises the UERL, the Met, the CSLR, the CLR, and the Great Northern and City Railway, which is what we now know of as the Moorgate to Finsbury Park section of the Great Northern Railway. Um, and they all agree on the adoption of the term underground as a joint branding. And as we were discussing earlier, um, possibly before the episodes... No, it was during the... It was when we were talking about architecture, wasn't it? We were talking about how this is when... Um, 
Ashfield decides that they're going to stop using the word tube to describe the various URL routes and they carve that off and squidge um, RLY um, into the space. Um, and they put up the big underground signs with the big yes. U and the big D yes. on the facades of the stations. And a lot of the earliest photographs of the Leslie Green design stations are when they did a survey of the wall to work out where to put up the signs on the exterior with the underground with the big U and the big D. And some yep. of them, you've even got that kind of painted in with black paint of what that sign would look like. Uh, I think one of the earliest photographs of the Earl's Court station building mm. as exists at the moment has a yet to be at the time painted in underground sign on its facade. And this is the first unifying brand for the underground uh, across the uh, across the, the country. That would be a, the national expansion of the underground. That's what the Met really wants. Um, <laughs> International that's... is what they wanted. But yeah, um, I mean that's what every person outside of London who complains about their transport connections wants. So, um, and so that's the first unifying brand across the underground network that we get. It's probably why we call it the underground. Hello, it's Simon. Sorry for the brief interruption to the show. First of all, a really big thank you for listening. It means a huge amount to me and Ella that so many people enjoy listening to our ramblings about railway and transport history. And we really enjoy that we're able to bring this information and research to so many people. If you'd like to help us to spread the message even further and to help us to make Rails to Nowhere even better, then you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. You can support us for as little as £2 per month. And in doing so, we send you some thanks, such as early access to all of our episodes, some extra bonus episodes, of which you'll have heard some snippets here on the free feed. And we send you some periodic written updates about how the podcast is progressing. So thank you for listening. Thank you especially to our patrons for supporting the creation of Rails to Nowhere. We couldn't do this without any of you, regardless of whether you're paying us or not. This podcast would be nothing without listeners. It's a huge amount to both of us. Thank you very much. And now I'll let you get back to listening to the show. Again, we come back to Leslie Green, who... The stations in which he was involved in the design um, <laughs> have what I what I think is a early example of trying to make the stations identifiable to users on board the train. Actually, no, I think that's 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 not in doubt, is it? Is the, the 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 tiling was probably for helping people identify the station. It's yeah, who it was aimed at is the yes. um, question. Um, the source, uh, I love, I do I do love um, Daniel Wright's uh, blog, The Beauty of Transport. It's absolutely wonderful, but it has in it the line, it is undoubted amongst historians that the tiling on Leslie Green stations was to aid the, Ill the more illiterate population of London at the time. And, I mean, it's possible that Green or whoever designed the tiling thought the population was illiterate but actually the population wasn't illiterate um and small point as a social historian i find it very annoying when people say this because it underplays the significance that things like the, the 1870 education act had and that actually by 1900 yeah if you're talking about 1800 about 40 50 percent of the population is illiterate in the 30 years from 1870 to 1900 the Victorians actually do a marvel of education and get it up to 97% literacy. Actually, the sources you were... I was talking to Paul about this earlier in the week and you were pulling up some sources from Tars of the Unexpected, which I shamefully don't own a copy of because getting hold of a copy is... Because you're not going to pay £500 on eBay, so... <laughs> no, I'm not going to pay 500 quid for a used copy on eBay, although apparently it is looking like it's coming up for a reprint at uh, 40 quid, which uh, would be fantastic for it being added to my bookshelf. But the quotes from Tars of the Unexpected, uh, which quotes some of the uh, newspaper articles from the time, indicate that actually, my interpretation, that actually it's for identification of stations for regular travellers, as well as just aesthetic pleasantness. 
um, yeah, are... I think very much driven by Yerkes' aesthetic sensibilities as an yeah. art collector and keen to promote his stations. Yeah, and I have a feeling that that's probably where it goes, is that Yerke says, I want them to be pretty, and then somebody, be that green, be that an engineer, be that whoever, says, you know what? If we made them distinctive, then that overcomes the issue of them all looking the same. Because if you're in an outside station, you've kind of got things about the way the buildings are laid out or the stuff around it are laid out that mean that when you look out the window, you go, oh, yes, I'm at that station. But if everything's just an underground station built in a tube, it all looks pretty much the same when you look out the window. But they would also have had at the... Sorry, you were... No, no, go ahead, Paul. I'd say they would also have had at the time, you know, a gate operator standing mm. on the end of every carriage who would have yelled out the station name. And well, there I are think... letters in the press at the time with people moaning a bit about the pronunciation of the station yeah. names by the gate operators. But they were definitely, that is evidence they were yelling them out. So yeah. you didn't even need to glance up from your newspaper. You could just hear where you were. Although I think it was the quote you sent that's uh, from one of the newspapers that said it means that you can identify the station without having the delay of waiting for the um, announcement of what station you're at. Um, but equally, this, I think it was the same article complained that actually the more simple solution would just have been to use more repetitions of the station name along the length of the platform. Um, I don't know. I like them. I think, I think it, they're nice, it's... though. That's the thing. Sorry, go ahead. One of the no, no, yeah, it's just one of the things that's been a criticism of the Elizabeth line, particularly when it first opened, is that it is the opposite. Mm. The stations are more distinctive from ground level than they are from platform level, with the exception of maybe the paintings at Whitechapel. And if you start to get to know them a bit better, you could you can tell them apart. But those. If, whenever I'm on the Elizabeth line in the central section, I'm like, am I at Farringdon? Am I at Bond Street? I don't know. They all yeah. look relatively the same. And it's so much nicer to take the Piccadilly line, not from an actual perspective of being on the train, but from a navigational perspective. I know that line well enough that anytime I look up in a station, I can tell you where I am before I see anything, which is, yeah, yeah that that is... Um, the way things should be designed because that's yeah. when you need to differentiate at platform level. And yes, I'm biased towards what I would term the best modern tube line on the network, which is the Jubilee line. Um, but again, the Jubilee line extension does that better than the Elizabeth line with each station's platform level being more distinctive from the others than um, than, than on the Elizabeth line. Um, what Leslie Green proved so successfully, though, is that you can do that cheaply. You don't need... Yes. The architectural extravagance of the Jubilee extension, you don't need the austerity of the Liz line grey, grey, grey platforms that get weird ghost shapes over the benches because they are permeable. You can just have a standard platform but then use different pretty colours yeah. of the same sort of tiles every yeah, day. Yeah, and it's an extraordinary execution of a very simple idea with long-lasting, very good solutions. Uh, I, th I think it is. It's a, it's a classic bit of underground design and it's really nice and it's wonderful that we still have some of them, although very few of the platform level designs are the original tiling, I think, now. Oh, apparently. Yeah, so... Bit of, bit of, what was I saying? Yeah, I think it's a really nice bit of design. It's really simple and straightforward, and as you say, quite cheap. Tiling isn't cheap, but relatively cheap. Um, and... I think it's cheaper than building Canary Wharf Jubilee lines. <laughs> very, so much so. <laughs> very much so. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it's a great thing to still have. But it's, it's still, as we say, not felt to necessarily be as identifiable as it could. So in the early, in, in about 1907, 1908, they begin sort of thinking about devices that could be used um, for the de delineation of the station name from advertisements. The other problem with the Leslie Green tiles, of course, is it means that the platform wall needs to be pretty clear of adverts for it to be useful. The moment you start putting sort of adverts and things on the platform, it begins to immediately diminish. You get diminishing returns on the usability of your tiling. And it's interesting that's not something that seems to have been expected by <laughs> Leslie yeah. Green. At least on the, the first bunch of stations, the Bakerloo and the Piccadilly stations were really not designed to have advertising space. So as soon as 
the advertising started being plastered up when they opened. It's another of those examples of there being actually a rather short heyday for Leslie Green's mm. work because it almost immediately got concealed with advertising. Yes. And then on the Hampstead Tube, which opened last, he'd already learnt that lesson and they had the design so that there was advertising space along the lower half of the wall and then the pretty patterns only on the top half of the wall. So they saved some money and also put in something that would still look good while advertising was there. So it's one of those, you can see Leslie Green having to evolve his ideas quite rapidly as he learned from experience. Yeah, it is forever my irritation that on our, our set of four Leslie Green design magnets from the Transport Museum, they don't line up properly because Old Witch has, is, has shorter tiles because it's made for the adverts, whereas Down Street and Houston and I don't know which the other one we have is, Piccadilly Circus maybe, it, they don't, they're all longer and it is I don't yeah, I think let it's them Charing sit Cross is yes. the, yeah. I won't let them sit next to one another on the fridge because I'm like, this is too annoying! <laughs> So they begin sort of thinking about how to make the station signage more identifiable. And we discussed earlier how St. James's Park Station is inside, under, part of the headquarters building at 55 Broadway. Um, so the, the underground group headquarters is already is at St. James's Park, so they use St. James's Park for a lot of trials. And they begin doing some sort of signage trials. Ashfield and Pick go and have a look at some designs from other places. Ashfield goes to Paris and has a look at what the Paris Metro is doing. And they're using what is kind of their standard sign now of blue blue sign with white writing on. They do some signage trials at St. James's Park. Is one of the, again, one of those mysteries of the early underground is who came up with the idea of putting a big red circle behind the blue bar. Some sources attribute it to Pick himself, some sources attribute it to other assistants and all sorts. Logo for London says 1906. So Joseph Carter, the company secretary for the District Railway, apparently in 1906 was examining ideas for station signage because they had particularly confused looking stations with the difference between, well, the plethora of advertising that we've discussed and the basically hidden station signs. And he at that point apparently suggested the idea of having a circle above and below, okay. uh, or half circle, I guess, above and below. And then in, where's it go, 1908... That was when they did the mock-ups at St. James's Park and they put on the Paris-inspired blue enamel with white lettering signage and then yep. they put the red paper half-circles above and below initially and then commissioned somebody called Mr. W. Lowe to refine that and try out different versions of it, which Pick then picked his favourite version of as yep. the final design for the version the disc version of the roundel in 1908 and the other interpretation of it is that it drives through the london general's um wheel design that it had on buses with the word general across the middle and it's pro I, I i mean i guess that's probably an inspiration probably probably filtered into it but again it's hard to sort of know definitively where these ideas are coming from because Probably nobody's really writing... Like, I would be massively surprised if any of these people are writing down at all. Um, oh, yes, I've had this idea because I looked at this. and It's not an art GCSE where you have to sort of write down, my inspiration for this is... I got in so much trouble with my... Sorry, can you tell that when I did art GCSE, I didn't like writing down the... I'm inspired to do this because I've seen this and this and this, and I got in oh, trouble for that. Oh, I love that, that bit. That was where I got all the marks. <laughs> like, you did the scrappy sketchbook drawing and then you get so many marks for writing half a page on on your inspiration for it yeah see this is why i got a c in my art gcse because i didn't do any of that and my art teacher kept being like but you have to say where your inspiration came from and i'm like i don't know i just sort of had an wow. idea wow i grew up in an entirely different education system where everything isn't based on exams and weird <laughs> things that be marked and no one was making anyone do that we were just p putting on plays and skits and getting <laughs> grades for them in drama class. I was horrified when I found out what GCSE and A-level drama look like. Anyway. <laughs> so I don't think anyone was right was writing down, I have designed this circle because I saw it on the side of a bus and that inspired me. Um, so it's not even like that sort of records that have been lost because who would actually be writing that down? So we just don't really know where the idea came from. Um, and exactly what the inspiration was. But we do know that at some point, 
Before 19010, the idea of a red circle emerged, and this was combined in 1908 with the blue bar from the Paris Metro to produce um, the early roundel, which we recognise, and which I was about to say is on Emily's um, dress, but... uh, None of the rest of the listeners can see that. Um, You can't see that, but I think it is evidence that how iconic and, and I've lost my word. I think it is evidence of how iconic and how just long lasting these design elements have been that people are still putting them on clothing and not just sort of, you know, weird handmade. I stuck this on clothing like this is commercially sold clothing and something that people want it's it's quite impressive and so this was initially rolled out on the UERL network and then latterly on to the city and south london and central london railways as those are further incorporated into the UERL's ownership over the 1920s and it becomes so ubiquitous and so recognizable for being the underground that the metropolitan railway decide they need to rip it off enough and therefore they design their diamond um, logo, which uh, is a blue bar with a red diamond around it, which looks very similar to the Madrid Metro's logo, except for the absence of the white inside of the diamond on that logo. I always say it's the little and or Aldi version of the roundel. It's like, yeah. it's close enough that you know what it is, but they're not, they're not quite infringing on the copyright. Yeah. It, uh, down where, whatever. near where I used to live, there was a, a shop. Uh, I want to say it was called, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it had blue letters with red um, stripes underneath. the uh, uh, Lesco. I've seen Lesco before. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, I think I think I've seen that before, um, and yeah, and so you, it's that. It's it's the saying. We we want to get in on this branding, but we don't want to be infringing too much on what you're doing. Um, and it begins rolling out across the network from about 1911. At some point in this period, um, it gains the white circle inside the red circle. Um, 1917. 1917, that thank was, you. It was, yeah, John uh, Pitt commissioned Johnston to have a revision of the roundels. The original disc version was, I think it was uh, it's, Harry It's on Wharton. a poster. It's behind you. It is, isn't it? What? <laughs> There's oh, a poster yeah, with version. all the dates of the roundels yes. behind you. You're right. You're right. That does have the dates on Although that doesn't have the disc version until 24, but it was 1917. Was Johnston having designed the typeface and finalised that for its initial version in 1916. Pick then said, could you have a look at this disc that we've been using for the past nearly a decade now and refine that? And that's when Johnston came up with the sort of donut version of it rather than the solid disc version of it that then got wheeled out within a couple of years. From then it was being used on publicity and being used on stations. Yep, it begins rolling out across the bus and tram network, and all of that sort of stuff as well. Again, bringing the unifying brand um, across the network. And when the LPTB comes into being in 1933, the strength of this identity they've created means that... Well, initially the LPTB think about changing their branding, and, and they're new, they want to change... Uh, uh, their identity i guess Uh, they think about having a new logo and they commission cecil bacon to design a logo Um, and this is what i've seen termed in some of these books i think it's logo for london refers to it as the flying snail Um, and this is the letters lptb um, with sort of speed lines coming off of it but even before the lptb actually comes into existence and adopts this logo they're already getting Johnston to design a LPTB version of the Roundel. They have and... a slightly awkward first version, don't they, which is underground, the standard underground Roundel, but then it has LPTB written in the upper bit of the white space, Yes, which doesn't look very good. And then no. Johnston comes up with the version that says London Transport. Yes, because the LPTB version, I want to say, is is the first bit that Johnson does. And Johnson says, I don't like this. I prefer the London Transport version. But Pick or Ashfield is like, no, we want the LPTB version. And then when you look at the minutes for the LPTB, one of the very first things they do is go, actually, shall we just trade as London Transport? 
Um, and I think from that point, they then begin adopting the London Transport logo. You see the Flying Snail logo, though, on a few bits of early publicity, though, between up to about 1934, 1935. It sort of occasionally crops up on the odd bit of publicity. It crops up much more on um, internal things, but it dies a reasonably quick death and is replaced by the roundel as the general um, logo that the organisation continues to use just with London Transport or Underground or whatever on it rather. Likewise, yeah, the LPTV, the Flying Snail, was never on any vehicles as far as I can see. It was never on a bus or on a train or a trolley bus. It was always just on internal documentation on a couple of public facing reports and posters and then disappeared so quickly because the vehicles they very quickly decide they're actually going to have the logo uh, not the logo the 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 written london transport um as the identifying mark on the sides of vehicles rather than the logo yeah basically just the like the general or the London Underground script that had been on the sides of the trains and the buses, and they just changed that, turned that into. London Transport. I mean, a, you can really see, as you were saying, it wasn't just that um, London Transport subsumed the Met. They basically were just, or sorry, the Underground Group subsumed the Met. It was just an Underground Group takeover, wasn't it? Yeah. They just kept the Underground Group branding, but yep. switched it for London Transport instead um, of Underground. And the buses. The bus livery is very similar to the general's bus livery that it had before. It is very much a, a an underground group slash general takeover of all of their competitors. And at the, around the same time as the LPTB is trying to work out its identity, um, it needs to think about what it's going to do for its staff uniform. And this was something I wanted to talk about in this, but I couldn't find stuff out. And Paul has managed to dig a few more sources. There's, there's so little about this, though. Um, and so the underground group decide that they need to do something with their uniforms. They need to have some sort of identifying thing. Or not, sorry, the LPTB need to have something identifying on their uniform so you can identify their staff. And I, I'm not entirely sure why they didn't. And I've, I've put in red here because it's, I can't remember what source it's in. Um, I feel I've read it somewhere that it was because they're thinking they're adopting the Flying Snail logo and that doesn't work on badges and uniform so per se so they're not going to use the roundel because that's not the logo and so they adopt a device of a griffin um for the uniform badges as the identifying mark of the company most organizations like lt that had an, a uniform would have some sort of identification on the badges of the staff uniforms it sort of derives from the military who would do the same everyone like the lner and the lms and all of them they will have they have badges that will have usually the crest or the LNER letters or Southern SR letters for the Southern. The Griffin actually survives reasonably well after the re-adoption of the roundel, really. It continues to be used as, as the, the buttons um, for the organisation. It finds its way onto the cap badge for the uniforms even after the roundel is adopted. So there's a sort of version of the roundel that's held up by griffins and it survives internally as well so it is adopted as the logo of london transport catering so it appears on all of the sort of crockery and and all those sort of things chipolatas bacon everything you could buy yeah chocolate bars you could buy all of these things with the griffin logo on them which you could take home as well they would sell them as groceries as well as selling them in the canteens and also for the london transport library um it also becomes sort of the uh, at least it looks like it's used as the image that's put on the borrowing slip front page of the the library books to mark them as part of the lt library so it seems like the griffin sort of becomes the sort of internal identity for internal things Um, at least some of them, and it also lends its name to Griffin Homes, which I couldn't find much about, so I'm kind of scrabbling around with what I can vaguely remember of it, and if I'm remembering correctly, Griffin Homes was the branch of London Transport that rented property to London Transport employees. Yeah, it was basically their internal social housing, and it was the examples I've seen, I think, are things like where they had old station masters' houses that they took over on some of the branches that were, you know, ex-Great Eastern Railway, uh, or in some cases demolished those and put up new buildings, which they then leased to members of staff. It was Tottridge and Whetstone we found them, wasn't it, Paul? Yeah, Tottridge. It was, I think it was the former state, it was the site of the station master's house in Tottridge and Whetstone, I think, was where Mm. they put up a couple of Griffin homes 
buildings. Yeah. And yeah, the, I tried looking because it got later taken over by an existing social housing organization when it split off from yeah. London Transport at some point. And it's, yeah, there's some corporate history available online, but very little. I feel like it would be a really interesting subject for a proper investigation and research yeah. and somebody to do at some point. But yes, it's again, it's one of yeah. those things is someone should look up, not me. I don't have the time to do that. As we've kind of alluded to, though, it kind of falls out of fashion or kind of falls out of usage through the 80s and 90s and into the thousands as uh, as Griffin Homes is sold off and then catering and stuff like that are outsourced eventually through the sort of 80s and 90s privatisation era. Well, the Croydon Catering Factory place, that was shut down in, what was that, the 80s, wasn't it? So I think it all disappeared about then. The cookery school at Baker Street closed in the 70s. So yeah, it was as things got privatised. And so eventually it sort of falls out of fashion. We're left with Johnston and the Roundel as the um, persevering corporate identity aspects of the organisation, which really, I guess, from a communication to the public point of view, is kind of really all you need. And then the sort of principles of how you use those sparingly and in a good way to communicate. Which does mean that actually, for all that this series you're doing is is focused on it being the... 1933 LPTB history effectively everything is is all pre that isn't it it's all just Mm. underground group stuff that got carried over they really did take over and the two attempts to come up with some new branding the flying snail and the griffin one of them lasted about a year and one of them was effectively entirely internal facing for its prominent uses and again disappeared within you know, maybe 50 years at most, which, okay, is yeah. actually quite a long time, but it's long gone now. Yeah. And everything else is Roundel, Johnston, and of course the one other bit which you're about to mention, which has persisted a bit better, but also was kind of pre-LT. I, I have previously expressed the view that actually I find it slightly interesting how we talk about the history of London Underground and London Transport starting in 1863 with the foundation of the Metropolitan Railway, which, yes, is when the oldest bit of... What we now know of as the London Underground opens, although I know in your Harrow and Wheelston episode you've made a case that that's an older bit of the London Underground. But actually, my view is that as an organisation, the history of Transport for London as an organisation actually dates back to the foundation of the Underground Group, because actually that's the organisation that bears the most resemblance to the the, the 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 lineage goes through that and yes the met gets subsumed into that organization but to an extent saying that 1863 with the opening of the metropolitan railway is the foundation of the london underground is kind of incorrect in my view and realistically it's 1901 ish with the foundation of the underground group that really that's when London Underground, that's when TfL draws its um, or it should draw its origin point. For... Definitely, and you see that not only in the public facing, you know, the Roundel, the Johnston, but also you see that in the fact that a lot of people internally, operationally, on the Underground still refer to it as the Combine, yes. which is a nickname which came about for the Underground Group in some point around 1910-ish. Um, as as this sort of conglomerate that was yeah. taking over all of London's transport, and that name has stuck around. That amazed me on my like my first couple of weeks at TfL when yeah. I was an apprentice, and somebody was talking about um, I think a J door key and how you could use this all across the combine. And I thought, wow, people are still using that yeah. term. I hadn't realised it was so pervasive. Uh, and I'm has... sure people, unlike you, who come into working for TfL without tons of background knowledge about TFL will have no idea anything about the history of that. And it is used so frequently yeah. by people who work for TFL. And it's just kind of the way it's always been. But I think it's interesting because that distinction you get, it's an it's hard. I agree with you that the history of the underground as we know it goes back to about 1900. And it is that sort of corporate history. But I think that's a lot harder for people to parse. Yes. And also, you know, you have that distinction of quite a pedantic distinction that's made between the tube and subsurface lines, which people go, well, subsurface lines aren't actually part of the underground, so to speak. But then that takes you back to 1890. And then they bought up. It's just... 
Oh, yeah, I, I agree. To- it makes perfect sense to just start from the first time someone stuck a railway underground in London. Oh, I'm aware. <laughs> to be able to, oh no, and I know you know that, but to be able to unpick that history and this, you know, you get the whole thing when we were in Istanbul, the whole thing about the tunnel or the tunnel, or I don't know how you say it, but being like, is this the first underground railway? And then there's like a tunnel that didn't have any stations in it in New York and stuff. It's, it does really give London a good level of sort of supremacy that oh, just yeah, to be yeah. able to say this was first and the the whole corporate history is more complex and you can listen to these very long podcasts by people like us about it. Yeah, I'm aware I'm being I am aware I'm very much showing the fact that I have a master's degree in railway history and wrote my dissertation on this when I sit here and have very academic statements about when when exactly did the history of transport for London really begin? Um but I and, and I again I expressed this I think previous episode um, where I was like uh, I was just talking about the fact that I find it again like we talk about eighteen sixty three but it's again yes that's a nice easy point to say the first underground line but also it's not when what we'd now call London transport even began because that begins with the trams and the horse buses and and that sort of thing and so but I agree that eighteen sixty three opening of the Metropolitan Railway makes a very nice, easy to understand um point for the general public. And realistically, that's kind of what I want as well as I want the general public to engage with history. And so I recognize that we need those easy ins. And then you can come to our come to to the level i'm I'm wittering on about and be coming and arguing with me about whether nineteen oh one or eighteen ninety or nineteen thirty three or 1863 is the genuine origin of London transport's history. <laughs> it's a bit like the academic idea of there being a long 19th century, which yes. started at some point in the 18th century and lasted until 1914, and all the arguments one can have about yeah. how long that should be and what defines yeah. the 19th century. It's the um, same sort of conceit, isn't it, of what defines a particular period or organisation yes. and how much fun can we have discussing um, it. We are looking at my thing. We're two hours and 14 minutes into this recording, which makes us the longest recording we've done thus far. Um, Have fun editing, Simon. (laughs) Um, So before we finish, I'm just going to finish on a little bit of a footnote. Um, And I've put here, when writing the scripts for these episodes, there's always something I have to cut out and something that I have to sort of consign to the footnotes of the episode. And very often I try and make that a thing that everyone knows about. And I couldn't really make it the roundel in this episode because we're talking about the branding and that's kind of central to what we're talking about. But I have made it the underground map because I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that talk about that. There's a lot of content on that. There's a lot of good history on that. And I, I don't think there's a lot I can add or that we... I don't know about you, but I didn't feel there's a lot I can add necessarily to that debate here. And I felt there was just listen to our Leytonstone episode. Yeah, listen to the Leytonstone episode. But I do think that there is a thing to pick up about the underground map that's interesting in terms of branding, because I think the underground branding has become so iconic that it permeates into things that people don't that it isn't actually associated with. And I think the map is actually a really good example of Mm. that because as anyone who's a sort of underground enthusiast will know, but the general public doesn't know those line colors aren't set in stone. They sort of settled around the sixties or seventies. And even then, you know, if you look at renaming the overground and changing things, things on that map in terms of color change. But what I find very interesting is When I am going around putting pictures on Twitter of random tiny corners of stations and asking people to guess which station they are, undeniably, they see something that's dark blue, they guess it's a Piccadilly line station, unless it's like, oh yeah, that's the tiles in North Greenwich or something like that. But there is a such strong association with London Underground branding that's come up with those colors that people can't uncouple the tube map from just design in the stations generally. I know it's some people that don't know much about stations ask a lot. Oh, did they make all the, oh, the Leslie Green tiles? Did they make all of the ones on the Northern lines or the Charing Cross branch Northern lines, some different shade of have black in them at some point. And they just, it's, it's, it's like that that branding has become so strong that it's just expanded overarchingly into everything Um, in a way that, you're like, no, actually, there is absolutely no connection between the colors of the terrazzo flooring and the lines that call it this station. Yes. But it's going to... And then 
what I think is really interesting is that it has become that. Like mm. when they redesigned Green Park Station, they put those subtle changes of tile colors in the tunnel to go from one line to another. Yeah. And it's like, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy yes. that people are like, oh, it must be about the line colors. It never was. And then because people feel that, it comes that way. And it's just an interesting of how much branding has seeped out of the underground yes. map to create that. And I think the underground map is also thinking about it with, with what you're saying there. I think it's also one of the few aspects of TFL's branding that's actually really easy to make a thing that looks a bit like it but isn't actually copyrightable as it. Um, mm -hmm. Because especially as London is actually quite unique in using the lines with what we call ticks, which are the little squares on the lines for the station stops. Like a lot of places use a little circle inside the line or something like that. So it's actually quite easy to put a coloured line with those sort of little square blobs on and it is instantly recognisable as a London underground thing and it really does ground it as sort of being a London thing. And I want to say it's Paper Chase that used to use that sort of design really extensively in a lot of its sort of things. And it does make it very easy to sort of be like, this is connecting us to the image of London. But it's also one of those things it's much easier to use, much more so than the roundel that is easier to use in a non-copyrightable manner for London It should be up there with your, your initial list of phone box, post yeah. box, bus, roundel, tube map. Yeah. Which... And you see it all over the world, too, because, like, I was at a tiny little coffee shop in, in, in a tiny town in in Northern Ireland and they had like the roundel symbol, but then they had all the coffees were a different line color yeah. and they had it looking like the line map. Just, it is just so clearly, and it's obviously been exported to so yeah. many other systems as well. Um, but the interesting thing, of course, and this is the one thing I did want to mention here, is that of all the bits of persevering identity for London transport, the line map, is the bit of identity that did not come out of Transport for London's own efforts to find a better identity and didn't initially meet with overwhelming um, support from the powers that be at London Transport. They weren't necessarily massively keen on it. It was designed by Harry Beck, as many people will know, and it wasn't... No, it wasn't... It was designed by Harry Beck, uh, who at the time was working as a draftsman, but not for London Transport... And he just draws it as a thing in the spare time and submits it to London Transport and initially meets with scepticism, I think, from the yeah, underground Pick group. And rejected it in 32 and then yep. accepted the revised version in 33. But and even then just before, make... it became London Transport. And it is it is initially a trial and there is scepticism, and it, but, it, but it proves popular and successful. And I think... It's interesting that it's met with some scepticism because I think um, that it, as its design, really fits perfectly within the aesthetic image that London Transport had at that point for the last 20-ish years been sort of trying to establish itself. It's interesting because we talked about earlier the sort of navigability with the mm. signage and things like that. And it almost makes me wonder if, because the mindset was, can the signage make it easier to navigate they wanted to keep that geographic mapping to ensure that people could navigate the whole city and and find their way between two stations because it's still a thing today obviously people will go oh i have to change here when actually you could yeah. walk for like three seconds and get to a different station yeah. And maybe they were they had their minds in that and not thinking about the actual better nav nav. I struggle that, with that yep. word navig. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, of the the map from a sort of mental perspective as opposed yep. to the physical perspective. But that's just a guess of sort of where their mindset might yep. have been. Even though these diagrams existed on other railways at the time, I can see why that was a big mental leap to see that as something people would yes. want when they're so used to a regular map and I, I wonder if part of the hesitation was also the fact that it's the difference I, I've no evidence for this but I'm speculating that maybe it's because unlike other railways the underground is serving a single conurbation where you can also travel by walking or bus or whatever around and they're sort of thinking well yeah on the LNER 
where you're talking about distances between King's Cross and York, it makes sense to have a diagram because there is no other way that you could make that journey. But actually, it's useful to be able to see the options. I wonder. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I guess they were. They were a you know unified transport organisation yeah. already, weren't they? It was the underground group running trams and most of the buses under the general brand. So I could see Pick being reluctant to have a map which only showed the tube services yeah. and didn't show those other services they were yeah. operating. And maybe also the timing was significant in that 1932, they were deep in the process of preparing for the passing yeah. of the Transport Act in 33, and perhaps were therefore reluctant to engage in what could have been a major rebranding exercise in advance of that, yeah. rather than waiting and seeing how things panned out. We don't know. The records don't exist, or we haven't found them, if they do exist. Um, anyway, we're running out of time on Again. this uh, recording, so um, we're kind of at the end of the script, realistically, so I'm going to say thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening to anyone who has persevered through whatever this two and a half hour recording has now turned into in terms of episode length. Um, and um, if we have any listeners who don't know who you two are and what you do, where can they find more Emily and Paul? Yeah, so we are Round All Round We Go. We are a podcast where every week episode we draw out a different station on the london underground all 272 of them we're not there yet we will probably die before we do it but we're trying to get there we draw out a different station every episode and we make a podcast about that station the history of it and the context of it but also the local area and things as well um we make our episodes in clumps of eight we've got 24 out on all podcast providers and we are hopefully in the not too distant future going to get our next clump of eight episodes coming out you can also follow us on the platform formerly known as twitter at roundel round pod and instagram at the same handle excellent uh, and it's an excellent podcast i really enjoy it otherwise thank you for listening um notices from rails to nowhere obviously if you found this podcast but don't listen to us on or don't follow us on any social medias you can also find us on instagram and the platform formerly known as twitter assuming that still exists when you're listening to this and if you want to hear me and ella live as i mentioned at the end of the last episode we will be joining uh, history indoors over on their YouTube channel on the, 30, the evening of the 30th of January. Um, they do talks over there and we will be joining them for a talk on modernism and railways, talking a bit about the Jersey Railway and the Underground, so sort of focusing on mine and Ellis dissertation works. But there will also be an option for questions and answers at the end. Um, it will be really embarrassing if nobody comes with any questions for us to answer. Um, so please do join us over there. Uh, otherwise, thank you for listening and we'll speak to you next time. This episode of Rails to Nowhere was presented by me, Simon Sarson Co, and featured the voices of guests Emily Turner and Paul Beckett Gray. Rails to Nowhere is produced by me and Eleanor Ashton, and is brought to you by our fantastic patrons over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to bring you this fantastic content, then you can do so for as little as £2 per month over at Patreon. You can also join as a free member now, and you'll get emails when we have updates and various um, episode releases so if you want to keep tabs on us that way rather than through the ever closing world of twitter um, or our instagram then you can do so as well in the meantime you can also find us as rails to nowhere over on twitter and instagram where we post a variety of updates on the podcast's progress anyway thank you for listening and we'll speak to you next time
Before we go, could I just mention the counterfactual bit, the odd LPTB, which I just absolutely love, that somebody, what was her name, Lillian Dring, in 1938, designed a poster with this kind of godlike character called oh, LPTB. Like which, that, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was like a phonetic pronunciation of the letters LPTB, but spelt E L P E T E B E. And it's this kind of semi mythical looking character ruling over the transport network. And Frank Pick saw this set of three posters and said he liked them and thought they were just too expensive to produce. But I just, I, I love this idea that the god LPTB could have become like the corporate character, like a Ronald McDonald style thing for the underground that would have been all over all the publicity for the next however many decades.